Hi, my name is Christine Luna Munger, and I serve as the director of the Episcopal House of Prayer in Collegeville, Minnesota. I'm here today to present uh, on the practice of Lexio Divina as contemplative prayer. I'd like to start our time together by inviting you who are listening to just think about the words or images that come to your mind when you hear the word contemplative. For many of us, the image of monks chanting or people placing themselves in contorted prayer positions uh, tend to be the things that come to mind. We might also think of thinking on something, ruminating on something, attending to something. Walter Burghardt uh, has a very simple definition that I've come to love. He describes contemplation as a long, loving look at the real. Again, it's simple and profound, a long, loving look at the real. Another writer, Martin Laird, tells us uh, that as human beings, simply we're built for contemplation. It is in fact a natural human capacity. And as such, we're all invited to be contemplatives. Um, as such, it's an inclusive practice and not necessarily reserved for some elite group of super prayers that we might imagine it to be for. In my own experience, I like to keep the contemplative in the realm of the practical. Um, and so I tend to think of contemplative practice as anything that helps us to broaden or deepen our relationships with God, self, and others. Folks um, often ask about the differences between meditation and contemplation. And so before uh, focusing today on Lexio as a specific contemplative practice, I'd like to speak broadly to different forms of contemplative prayer in the Christian tradition. In addition to asking about the difference between meditation and contemplation, a lot of people also ask about the difference in those two terms as they relate to practice among some of the world traditions, especially nowadays between Buddhism and Christianity. I would say that broadly we could categorize Buddhist teaching as leaning in the direction of meditation and Christian teaching as leaning in the direction of contemplation, though it's certainly not as clear cut as that, and both traditions recognize that there are a lot of nuances between the two terms. Generally, meditation is practice that hones the faculty of the mind, while contemplation is practice that suffuses all of the faculties, including our affect, our will, um, However, sometimes we do see prayer methods that incorporate uh, all of these faculties of the different prayer form modes together. For example, in the classic Christian model of Lexio Divina, there are four steps on a metaphorical ladder. And with each step on the ladder, one decreases mental efforts and increases effort in the other faculties um, as your prayer ascends the ladder. For example, the second step of meditation is a step up from the first more mentally active step of reading. In reading, one uses the mind to take in the general gist of the words. And in meditation, the practitioner ruminates or thinks on the meaning of the text. The third step, prayer, uh, flows naturally from meditation and again sort of shifts from head to heart and is presumably dialogical as a conversation with God about whatever has been discovered through the meditation. Contemplation as the final step uh, flows from prayerful conversation into a state of restful communion and adoration and therefore focuses more on our affect um, and even on our will to the degree that we uh, sit quietly. Throughout the Christian tradition, tr Christian teaching tradition on prayer, a number of forms have emerged. And as I said, I'd like to share a few of these terms uh, and describe them a little bit in order to provide a practical foundation for our understanding of Lexio as a contemplative practice that is situated within the Christian tradition. So let's start with recollection. Recollection is a classic Christian term that refers to the active gathering of oneself in preparation for meditation and contemplation. Teresa of Avila, a 16th century mystic and reformer, regularly instructed the nuns in her communities to practice recollection. 
Evelyn Underhill, a 20th century mystic and teacher, describes recollection in the following way. Recollection is the art which the practical person is invited to learn. In essence, it is no more and no less than the subjection of one's attention to the control of the will. Recollection is a constantly renewed retreat to the quiet center of the spirit. Recollection is a change of the attention which enables you to perceive a truer universe. Some lovely words from Evelyn Underhill. I like to think of recollection in sort of a summary way as that deep breath that you take before you begin something. It can be formal prayer or any activity of your day. Recollection involves gathering yourself into yourself by slowing down, by stilling your mind and heart, and by tuning in to the present moment. Recollection is a preparatory practice for prayer, although we could probably consider it as part of the continuum of prayer. And recollection helps us to increase our awareness when we're in the more formal stages of prayer. Underhill adds that another form which is related to recollection is simplification. She describes simplification as a deliberate withdrawal of our attention from the bewildering multiplicity of things, a deliberate, humble surrender of one's image-making consciousness. She suggests that this gathering point of selfhood is already there within us. It's an important possession, which adds dignity to our human existence. Yet, she notes, humans rarely take the time to go in. I would like to suggest that simplification is important because it reminds us that God is always already present and at work in our lives. Simplification encourages us to let go of our many ramblings, our bumbling efforts, and recognize God's efforts in us. By tuning in to our interior space, we connect deeply with our spirit and allow life's distractions on the surface to take their place on the back burner. When we practice simplification, we expand our vision and we begin to see things more as God sees them. Seeing life with divine vision encourages us to let go of everything that is not life-giving, to not get caught up in distractions and illusions. Fortunately, a disciplined prayer life usually leads to quite practical consequences. And so when we begin this process of starting to see things as God sees, we're naturally drawn into acting as God would wish. Real contemplative prayer forms end up causing us um, and moving us towards conversion, to making life changes for the common good. In this sense, Under the Hill um, speaks of another form that emerges out of our prayer. She calls it self-adjustment. And she says that it follows recollection and that self-adjustment is a deliberate rearrangement of your ideas, your energies, and your desires in harmony with that which you have seen in recollection. It's a progressive uniformity of life and experience and we could maybe say that if recollection changes the focus of our attention, then self-adjustment is that which helps us to make changes in our affect and in our will, again, in that more active side of things. In Christian terms, we might refer to this active work of self-adjustment as the work of discipleship, of aligning our lives with how Jesus lived his life. For example, contemporary practitioners of Lexio have added a fifth step to the four steps of Lexio, which is incarnatio. This term draws upon the theological teaching of incarnation and implies that our prayer period should naturally flow into some action and way of being in the world. In her teaching, Evelyn Underhill goes into more detail about the tools that can help us develop our discipleship as Christians. We might think of some of these tools as the building blocks for building up a good moral life, as they're part of our common Christian heritage of spiritual formation. Underhill notes, um, and this is a quote from her, that related to self-adjustment, we see purgation, detachment, and mortification. 
In her words, purgation is the disciplining and simplifying of our affections and our will, of the orientation of our heart. Detachment is the refusal to anchor yourself to material things, to regard existence from the personal standpoint, or to confuse your own customs with necessity upon everybody else. And mortification, again, kind of big classical Christian terms here, uh, means to resolve the turbulent whirlpools and currents of your own conflicting passions, interests, and desires. In her words still, it's the killing out of all of those tendencies which the peaceful vision of recollection would condemn and which create the fundamental opposition between your interior and exterior life. Well, I, what I really appreciate about fleshing out the meaning of these three terms is that it helps us to recognize that there's an inherent connection between the active and passive aspects of contemplation and transformation. Contemplation can be active and actions can be contemplative. Recognizing this connection makes it more likely that we will see God in everything and everywhere, rather than only in certain times and in certain places. Practices like purgation, detachment, and mortification also helps us to see that the best place to begin prayer, as well as the best place to begin making a difference in the world, is with what in our inner lives spills over into our lived lives. So for a moment, let's turn our attention back to the inner work by further fleshing out the distinctions between meditation and contemplation. Underhill writes that meditation is a halfway house between thinking and contemplating. And as a discipline, it derives its chief value from this transitional character. She asserts that meditation and contemplation are also part of normal daily life activities. And in her words, she says, the real mystical life, which is the truly practical life, begins not with supernatural acts and ecstatic apprehensions, but with the normal faculties of the human person. Simply put, meditation is use of the faculty of the mind, of thinking, in order to sort through the vast meanings that may come at us in any given day, in order to discern the voice of the sacred, the voice of wisdom. As the active element, our minds are good at sorting and distinguishing, and when we meditate on something, we ruminate over it, trying to discern its core. When we shift from the mind to the heart, we begin to enter the realm of contemplation, which is also a completely natural human faculty. Underhill agrees and suggests that one of the best definitions of contemplation has described it as a loving sight. It falls very much in line with Walter Burkhardt's definition. She asserts that we are not asked to look at anything new, but simply to peer into the deeps of things, to gaze with a new and cleansed vision on ordinary intellectual images. Underhill asserts that contemplation is an act of love, it is a wooing, not a critical study of divine reality. Contemplation is an eager outpouring of ourselves towards a somewhat other for which we feel a passion of desire, a seeking, a touching, a tasting, not a considering or analyzing. And so we see that in our prayer, we need our minds and our hearts. So having set the table with this feast of terminology in classic forms, let us turn our attention now to the contemplative, from the contemplative container to the specific spiritual practice of Lexio Divina. I will start with the historical overview and then follow up with a presentation of some practical points. Lexio, Lexio Divina is Latin for sacred reading, and it is an ancient Christian practice, most often associated with monasteries. Most people today who are familiar with Lexio Divina think of it as a Benedictine practice. While the practice was carried through the centuries in varied monasteries, it did have a pre-Benedictine pre origins, and the famous version of Lexio was actually not formally adopted until much after Benedict's life. 
over time in Christian history, we see a general movement towards a more inclusive view of the role of reading scripture and praying with scripture in the daily spiritual practice of common Christians, not just those that are living in monasteries. Whereas historically, especially before the invention of the printing press, the reading of sacred scripture tended to be reserved to only the few, special elite in times past, those who could read, those who could write, those who had access to the sacred texts. A current renewal invites a broader inclusion of lay people into engaging the scripture. In patristic times, during the first few hundred years of Christianity, we see general tendencies toward allegorical readings of scripture, that is to find the kind of hidden meaning between, underneath the literal meaning of the words. For example, Origen in the third century viewed scripture as a sacrament. And in a letter to Gregory of Neocesaria, Origen wrote, quote, when you devote yourself to the divine reading, seek the meaning of divine words, which is hidden from most people, unquote. Origen believed that the word or logos was incarnate in scripture and could therefore touch and teach readers and hearers. Origen taught that the reading of scripture could help move beyond elementary thoughts and discover the higher wisdom hidden in the word of God. After Origen, other church fathers such as St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, and St. Hilary of Poitiers used the terms Lexio Divina, sacred reading, or Lexio Sacra to refer to the reading of scripture. According to Jean Clerc, a Benedictine, the founders of the medieval tradition of Lexio Divina were St. Benedict and Pope Gregory I. Later in the 12th century, uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux was instrumental in re-emphasizing the importance of Lexio within the Cistercian order. St. Bernard considered Lexio Divina and contemplation um, as practices that were guided by the Holy Spirit and that they were keys to nourishing Christian spirituality. So over and over again, we see in our tradition an emphasis on engaging uh, scriptures through the practice of Lexio Divina, often renewing um, communities. The commonly recognized contemporary four-step progression from Bible reading to meditation, to prayer, to loving regard for God was first formally described by Guigio II, who was a Carthusian monk and um, prior of a community in Grand Chartreuse. He died in the late 12th century and while he was alive, he wrote a text called The Ladder of Monks. And the subtitle of that book is A Letter on the Contemplative Life. And this uh, text is considered the first description of methodical prayer in the Western mystical tradition. In Guigio's four stages, one first reach, which then leads one to think about or to meditate on the significance of the text. That process in turn leads the person to respond in prayer as the third stage. And the fourth stage is when the prayer in turn points to the gift of quiet stillness in the presence of God, as we've seen called like, contemplation. Uh, Guigio named these four steps of the ladder of prayer with the Latin terms, uh, lexio, meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. And I'd like to just uh, do a quick pull up of those words for those of you who are visual. There are the words in Latin, lexio, meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. Again, Latin words to describe these four stages. By the beginning of the 16th century, the methods of this methodical prayer had reached Spain. And we find that St. John of the Cross taught the four stages of Guigio II to his monks. And during that same century, the Protestant reformers such as John Calvin were also continuing to advocate for Lexio Divina. Much later then, in the early part of the 20th century, we see that there was a need again for a revival of the practice of Lexio. And a number of books and articles on Lexio Divina aimed this time at the general public begin to appear by the middle of the 20th century. In 1965, one of the principal documents of the Second Vatican Council um, in the Catholic Church called, which was the dogmatic constitution called Dei Verbum, Latin for the word of God, uh, 
also emphasize the use of Lexio Divina. Uh, much more recently, when the 40th anniversary of that document, Dei Verbum, was celebrated in 2005 in the Catholic Church, Pope Benedict XVI reaffirmed the importance of Lexio Divina, stating, I would like in particular to recall and recommend the ancient tradition of Lexio Divina. The diligent reading of sacred scripture accompanied by prayer brings about that intimate dialogue in which the person reading hears God who is speaking and in praying responds to God with trusting openness of heart. If it is effectively promoted, says Benedict, this practice will bring to the church a new spiritual springtime. So speaking of springtime, I'd like to now shift from this historical overview to more practical um, pieces on Lexio Divina. First of all, it's important to note that praying with scripture is distinct from studying scripture. In studying scripture, we seek information. In praying with it, we are formed and transformed. So we have information, transformation, and formation. Uh, more specifically, we don't have to have formal theological education in order to engage scripture as a prayer. If we were to make public formal announcements about the meaning of the scriptural texts, then yes, it would be helpful to have um, some formal training. But in the context of our own prayer lives, we can trust that God will communicate with us, even if we don't have a stockpile of academic knowledge. Lexio Divina as prayer uh, also, in a very practical sense, tends to undo our conventional ways of interacting. Uh, especially in the West, we're very accustomed culturally to quick and efficient and productive interactions and communications. Um, and again, in this sense, the practice of Lexio Divina has a transformative practical aspect. When we practice Lexio, we're more likely um, to be. Uh, engaged in pausing, in silence, and in pondering. And that sometimes seeps over not only from our prayer periods, but into our everyday interactions. So our contemplative interactions are distinct from our conventional interactions. Lexio has also been feasted, uh, excuse me, has been likened to the con to the metaphor of feasting on the word. So we get a very practical embodied metaphor here. Um, first, folks like to think of the first step of Lexio when we read the text as taking a bite. And then when we begin to chew on that text, uh, we enter into uh, meditatio, the second stage of meditating. And then as we shift to the third stage of praying with the text, we find ourselves savoring the essence of that uh, text and its meanings. And finally, when we enter into the fourth layer of contemplatio, contemplatio, we think about digesting the food and making it a part of our body. Um, in our Christian tradition, this embodied form of meditative prayer um, presumably leads us to an increased and direct knowledge of Christ. Engaging in Lexio uh, presumes a few key theological presumption, presumptions or beliefs about God and how God interacts with us as humans. First, um, the first theological presumption is that God is not somewhere far off and distant, but rather is close and personal. If we're going to be listening for the word of, for a word of God in God's word, um, we have to assume that God will communicate with us intimately. In theological terms, we call our sense of God as ultimate, sort of out there and beyond us, as transcendence. And we call our sense of God as intimate, imminence. The truth is that God is both. And while it is true that God as mystery is ultimate, it is also true that God as presence is intimate. And the method of Lexio Divina assumes that God personally gifts each of us in special and particular ways with a word that shimmers or a phrase or an image that catches our attention as we're reading the sacred text. So this is the basis for the very practical teaching that one should not set out to read long sets of scripture at a time with any particular goal in mind. 
some of us say, I'm going to read all the way through John, or I'm going to start at the beginning of the Bible and finish. Um, rather, in Lexia, we should expect to re read short sections and read those readings very slowly, allowing the word and the meaning to seep in. As we slowly engage the text, then we keep our mind and our heart open to God's communication. And again, when a word or a phrase or an image catches our attention, we then become curious. What might God be wishing to communicate through this phrase that has caught my attention? Once we allow for that shift to presume that God can use images and phrases through the attention that we follow, um, then we can flow from the reading of the text into more of a ruminating phase, um, which is, as we have seen, starts with meditation and then um, prayer and contemplation. A second assumption is that God constantly speaks to each of us. Um, and the important word there is constantly. This assumption draws upon our human capacities to think and to feel and to sense and imagine so the method of Lexio assumes that God uses all of those holistic human capacities or our faculties as means through which God can communicate with us. There are a number of uh, resources available that uh, speak more in depth about the practice and benefits of Lexio Divina. I think, for example, of Norveen Best, um, who has written a number of texts on Lexio and its practice. Another well-known author um, is Michael Casey, who has written, uh, a Benedictine, who has written um, a book called Sacred Reading. And a third resource that I would direct you to possibly is Basil Pennington, who has also written not only on Centering Prayer, but also on Lexio Divina. I hope that this little taste of the contemplative container and the practice of uh, Lexio Divina has nourished your mind and your heart for today.